welcome to another draft physics presentation. Such. All right, tonight I thought I'd do another video about this uh, response video by the mindless marbles guy and a couple of the troll comments on his video. So it's good somebody makes videos among this group of whatever they are, <laughs> just so I can see their comments, um, because it's just the same routine of you know uh, accusations veiled, not veiled, that aren't defendable by anything called evidence. So anyway. So he says, a low-quality video, you know, I'll agree. To an inconsiderate jerk, yes, like you're something else besides an inconsiderate jerk yourself, uh, where I do a few simple things, yes, I do a few simple things also, uh, he should have done long ago. So I should have put a paper cone around a flashlight <laughs> to do the experiment a long time ago and used a big thick piece of glass. I should have done that a long time ago. I don't think I should have done either one of those. So again, just more pointless rag. So he does a really inadequate experiment, poorly and doesn't really deal with any of the theory that is the whole thing at question, is the theory. So I'll go through what their theory is, even any explanation, and how underdone the physics is of those explanations. This whole idea of half-silvering a mirror. Half-silvering won't work, actually. Theoretically, it can't work. It has to be some other number, not half. <laughs> by, their own, by, by just logical reasoning. So anyway, so the Devo, whatever the Silo guy is, why is he so desperate to win Gary's approval, question mark? So he's such a troll, he's trolling the other troll, which is funny. Um, <clears throat> do what the rest of us do and sit back and enjoy this foul-mouthed bigot. So I'm a bigot much way. How am I, how am I bigot? <laughs> you know, what, what, what do you, I don't know, what, what do you, what's Devo Elo mean? I don't know. You're a Mexican who doesn't believe in mufflers? <laughs> you know, doesn't speak English? Yes, so... Mexicans who don't speak English and don't believe in mufflers, I'm bigoted against, quote-unquote, whatever bigoted means. Uh, such a stupid, yes, I don't like them. <laughs> yeah, I think they're jerks. Hey, I mean, when they come here and expect me to learn Spanish, they immigrate to the United States and expect me to learn Spanish. That's like me going to China and expect all the Chinese people to learn how to speak English. I think that would be retarded. So I call it what I see it as, and that means I'm a bigot. Is that it? Anyway, waste another seven years of his life with this cockamamie theory, so... Again, just so he, it's a so bad a theory, and yet he can't debunk it with a single fact. He can't point out a fact, an experiment, a real thing, to explain why my theory is cockamamie. Um, and so he can resort to his name calling, for which he will be allowed to just do that here, uh, you know, in, in Troll Central. And this Alexander Zappia cunt, um, he says, uh, if you read the description, you see he calls Gary inconsiderate jerk and explains he's doing basic checking. So he's doing basic checking by doing another really bad experiment. Now, I didn't claim my experiment was debunking anything beyond just pointing out how glass... So you can see that this mathematic... So as I make it thin, the one... one be that if something happens to the light on one of these tabs, then what this guy says is also a misinterpretation. Be 80% from one surface. 80 degrees if it's just one surface. If it's reflecting on both surfaces, then it's some other degree. Lower, presumably. Uh, light to be reflected. Um, is to challenge him and act of gaining approval. And right, so he could challenge me again with more um, poorly done argumentation um, and, and, and distortions of what the other person is actually claiming. Straw man arguments, essentially. All right, so back to the basic ideas, the interferometer. <coughs> light goes in, uh, reflects, comes back, goes through, light goes through, comes back, and reflects. Now, if you understood these as two paths, so you know, we'll color this one. Um, well, I should just color the return paths, but it doesn't really matter. You can see that if something happens to the light on one of these paths, there's the, the path that goes through the, the splitter. So this is the end up being the one that went through the first time. And this is the one that ends up going through the second time. You could understand <coughs> that the argument I'm making is pretty obvious that if you had a if you have a surface, oh, no, sorry, forgot, I turned the drawing on. That would help. Ah, there it is. Could make it bigger, Gary. Well, I'll worry about that later. All right, so there's two paths. You're, and the point is, is it goes, when it goes through the glass, it's getting diverged because it's going through a bunch of half-silvered mirror by their theory. And when it does that, the light will, by probabilistic rules, go in one of these paths. And so obviously the paths are not straight paths. 
obviously a high percentage of the path will be a diverging path, okay? an angle. And that angle will just get multiplied with distance. So the further it, tra it travels, the more the light is spreading. So it's spreading, and then when it reflects, it spreads. So one path is spreading for the entire length and back, and going through, back through this, reflecting off the splitter. So one, one beam will be highly diverged. The other beam will only diverge this little tiny bit here. So the other beam will just be, be tiny, tiny bit diverged. So those are hardly equal beams. So the theory of the interferometer is you're using equal beams, that there's two, the two paths are in every way equal. And there's, <clears throat> and so you can do this recombining of light or splitting of light and all this stuff. And you're working with two equal beams. So any change you see um, will be a reflection of some intrinsic or fundamental property. So, but clearly, boy, the mic is in the red a lot. Let's see, maybe turn something down here. Again, let's see here, I think. Hello? Which way do I turn it? I turn it around this way. Off is that way. So it really, <laughs> it just doesn't seem intuitive. This way it should be off. All right, well, yeah, that just doesn't look very good. All right, uh, turn the mic around. Sorry, I shouldn't change the volume in the middle of the video, but I don't like it going red. Anyway, I'm sorry, it's not one of my better videos so far, but maybe it'll get better. Um, all right, so there's a theoretical problem with the beam splitter. So all of this is you know, an argument about what happens when light goes through one of these beam splitters. You know, you make the piece of glass bigger and try to understand some of this stuff. Now, there's a, another subject related to this subject is in the Feynman lectures, where he describes Newton's glass. And so Newton did a ton of experiments with layers of glass, with thicknesses of glass. And what he discovered is, is that you can change the thickness of glass, that is, you can, you can shave a little bit off the surface, and you can change the reflective index of the glass anywhere from 0 to 16%. So you can make the glass reflect total 16% of the light, or none of the light, 0. You can make it, so if you get just the right thickness, and those, and that pattern repeats. So at every section, you could repeat that same pattern. So as I make it thinner and thinner, it goes from 16 to 8 to, to 0 to 60 to 8 to 16 to 0 to 8 to 16. So it just repeats that same pattern over and over again. And as Feynman pointed out, they've done it with glass a meter thick. And they still have the same effect. They just polish a little tiny bit off, and they can get to 0, and then 16%, 0, 16%, you know, with the 8 in between. Um, so that's a feature of glass that's very interesting. And that would also be affecting the reflective index. So that means that if the angle, how much how much of the light reflects at a certain angle, you know, this is what we're sort of talking about, is this angle, um, that that angle would also create more or less reflection, you know. Um, so maybe the slide glass I'm using has the right reflective index, that is the glass is the right thickness, that at 45 degrees, it creates a 50-50 beam splitter. So I'm just saying this is another feature of glass. Nobody accounts for it. Nobody talks about it. Nobody talks to it, about it in relation to the creation of beam splitters. Nothing. Okay, so the point is, <clears throat> I would make an argument, if we're going to worry about explicit language, and uh, everything has to be so, we're going to hold everybody to everything they say, <laughs> okay? Um, the very idea of the, the idea of the light comes in, and we say on straight, and then we should expect 4% off the surface. Well, the trick is 4% <clears throat> of the light had reflected off. So there's only now 96% of the light left. It's only 90%, 96% hits the second surface, right? So this only, this is 96%. So it could be 4% of 96%, if you get me, right? So, so it's still going to be not 8, it's going to be 7 point something because I finally ran out of black. Um, <clears throat> because there's less light that gets through the second surface. So it could never be actually 8%. So that size not even precise. So it's always going to be some factor dependent on how much light actually got to the second surface. Well, it's going to dictate how much light reflects off of it, theoretically. All right. <clears throat> so um, I guess I need a new drawing. Uh, probably wouldn't hurt how to do this uh, efficiently, uh, paper efficient or whatever. All right, so back to the 
piece of glass again with the mirrored surface to make my argument. So <clears throat> the mirrored surface, if it was if it was 50-50, okay, 50%, 50%, that wouldn't work either for this very same reason. Because we know some of the light, especially at 45 degrees angle, some of the light is going to reflect off the first surface. So we know as a fact that it's going to be, um, it, it increases with the angle. So I'm just saying we know that straight in did 8%. And so angles are going to be more percentage, 16%, some other kind of number. And so we know that we're going to lose, let's say, let's say we just make it 16% for the sake of argument. So now we only have 84% getting to the second surface. So only 84% gets to the mirrored surface. So we only have 84% of the original 100%. <clears throat> and so what I was supposed to believe the same 16% is going to, so, so now we have a 50-50 mirror so where the mirror isn't okay that's going to have a 16 percent even without so, so the little blocks that are are the openings between the mirror those are going to be 16 percent the same percentage as the surface but the ones with the mirror we know those are going to be 100 percent of whatever hits them so you can see that this mathematics gets a little complicated i mean it's going to be 16 percent that will reflect even off the empty spots so the place where there is no mirror, the light's going to go in, and 16% of it's going to reflect off even though there's no mirror there. And 100% of the light that gets to the second surface, that is 100% of the 84% that hits a spot that has mirror, that's going to reflect. And so only 84% of 50%. So now we have 50% of 84% of the light minus 16%, right? So we're 50 of the 84% and then minus another 16% that's going to reflect when it should go through. So the light going through is going to be 50% um, 84, which is 42%, <laughs> you know, and then 16% of the 42%, which leaves whatever, some other number. Anyway, it's going to be some fraction of this, which might only be 25%. So only 25% of the light or something is going to actually get through the mirror. And that light is going to be diffracted. So you can obviously see that a 50-50 mirror, a 50-50 coating on the mirror wouldn't work because only 84% of the light is going to get to that surface. And then once it gets to that surface, 16% of it's still going to be reflecting off of the mirror, I mean the glass layer, and it won't go through. So clearly it can't be a 50-50 mirror. It's, there's no logic to defend the idea that a 50-50 mirror could possibly work in that location. In that configuration so it would have to be some other percentage 25 75 or 40 30 or something it'd have to be some other percentage of coding versus non-coding and again i just reiterate any light <coughs> that goes through essentially is going through a quantum mechanical um you know huygens heisenberg space which will cause that light to diffract and spread uh, over permutations each each one will pop out at a different angle, but the, the average will be a cone of light that is diverging. So now the light's not going to be going parallel anymore. It's going to be spreading. It's going to be traveling at a different angle than the light that reflected, which the light that reflected isn't diverging at an angle. It's angle in, angle out. On the mirror, it's angle in, angle out. There's no divergence of this beam. So this beam is all coherent light all um, moving together and this beam is all spreading light not moving together ah blue is running out too um so this is this is real arguments now to go one step further to complicate this <coughs> i also observed in doing the experiment that these people ridiculed um as somehow i should have done some other experiment um was finding out that you don't need half silvered mirror in the sense that any <clears throat> any dirt um, you get on the, the glass surface will create that diffraction. And depending on which way the light's going, so let's just say this is dirt or water molecules or anything separated by a distance, that what happens is when the light comes in, it <clears throat> refracts. So that was something I never didn't point out in all of this too. The other factor you have to consider is that when this light comes in, it's angle in, angle out for the reflection. 
but the internal, the stuff that goes through refracts, so it changes the angle a little bit. And so now this steeper angle means that less light will actually reflect here. So this won't be 16%, it'll be something like 15%, it'll be some kind of, well not 16, 13% uh, or some other percentage based on how thick the glass is and how much the, the refraction is. So the light always um, refracts when it comes to the second reflection it's going to be a refracted beam that will be coming at a lesser angle which means that the reflecting index will be different and the only way you defeat that is if the light comes straight through because then it doesn't refract it's supposed to not to it's supposed to not to yeah it's supposed to not to um so this gets really complicated in terms of understanding why these things exist i've, I've sort of explained that the atoms have an alignment where they're in glass, where there's every likelihood that they're spaced at these geometric angles. And so when the light comes in, when you rub some of the surface off, you're changing the shape of these atoms in terms of their alignment a little bit. So as you change, you can't take a half an atom off, you can only take a full atom off. And so as you start to change the pattern of the surface, that's what's changing the reflective index. Um, and that's happening because the atoms line up to the entire length of the glass. So what you do to the surface also changes the other surface on the other side. Both surfaces are changed by being changed into one of the surfaces because the atoms have to realign uh, to keep doing this odd even thing. I mean, sort of, I think you better if I did that in colors, I guess. But, you know, the idea is, is they don't line up, you know, they're, they, these two line up, these two line up, and these two line up, these two line up. They're, they have a geometry um, that they'll always seek. And then when you start changing one surface, you'll change the other surface because the pressure will change. Glass is technically a liquid. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, back to the garbage on the surface. So what is found to be uh, um, one of the <clears throat> functions of this optical experiment, this idea of creating a beam splitter, one of the complications of it is, is that, yes, if you have any, any irregularity on the surface at all, what happens is, is the light comes in, it goes through the, the, the spaces between the matter bits, it essentially creates a single slit experiment, and the light will reflect at all these angles. Now, these angles can end up being very sharp angles. So, this angle, for example, is a very it's a stronger angle than the angle coming in, and this angle would be much stronger than the angle coming in. So at the higher angles, there's a more, there's a higher likelihood of internal reflection. So essentially, you can't draw it very well in this image, but the idea would be is the, it spreads out more, but I mean, a millimeter is a lot on the physics level. But the idea would be is the light reflects inside the two layers. And <clears throat> at any one of these points, there could be a 4% chance that the light goes out. So at this layer or this layer, there's a 4% chance each time it hits that the light would go out here. Now this, and then if it keeps bouncing, it would go out here. So it could go out at any one of these locations. Now, clearly what you can sort of understand by those internal reflections is that that is very reminiscent of the ring pattern. So it gives you a perfectly rational, reasonable explanation for why the pattern in the interferometer is a bunch of concentric rings inside of each other is because these are the internal, these are just a reflection of light that got further and further. So this light only reflected twice, and then this light reflected four times, and this reflected eight times inside the glass, and this one 16, this one 32, whatever the numbers would be. But yes, the further out the band is, the more internal reflections it survived, the probabilities, like rolling dice, it didn't roll craps, you know, it didn't roll snake eyes. So they say only when you roll snake eyes, you pop out. So you can sort of understand that you rolled a lot of dice and it didn't roll snake eyes, so it ended up way out here. And, you know, and with each one, it just means that, yes, this guy happened to roll the dice and he got snake eyes the first time, and he's out. So more, more, there would always be more energy in the inside. There would be more intensity because there's, by the time you get out here, there's fewer permutations. Fewer dice survive. Dice rollers survive to do their 30-second roll, okay, or their 40-second or their 50-second. So as soon as you as soon as you roll snake eyes, you can't roll the dice anymore. So obviously these rings would be much brighter, 
and these ring, rings will be much dimmer because there's fewer permutations out here. The odds aren't any different. It's just there's fewer people still rolling dice. So there's obviously fewer chances to create a photon in that location. So anyway, this is the complexity of the experiment. This is the real stuff that has to be talked about and understood to understand what a beam splitter does. And these mockers and ridiculers, that's all they are. They're just mocking and ridiculing the fact that I'm pointing out how this experiment is really complicated. And they're trying to make it into some kind of simple thing where you just have silver or a mirror and you have two 50-50 beams. And that's obviously not what takes place. It's obviously more complicated than that. There's obviously a lot more physical phenomenon going on. So now let's just get to the fact that we don't, we're not given any consistent argument for what's happening here consistent with their theory of quantum mechanics. So somewhere in here, we're, we're if I state it as a fact, that there's no, so let's see if they have a, a counter argument. There's no evidence and there's no theoretical argument made that different photons, two different photons, can create a wave function or do anything, and the different photons can interfere with each other and create an interference pattern. Quantum mechanics basically says a single photon hits an obstruction or some kind of object that causes it to break into two wave functions. Those two wave functions can do separate things, <coughs> and then they can recombine into a photon that lands in a location. But there's no argument that these wave functions are, are ghost tons, okay, that are going to somehow get out of phase, you know, do something to get out of phase, and then interfere, <coughs> and, and then end up in a different location because their phase is different. What's well, even doesn't even make sense. Even when you try to make it make sense, you can't make it make sense. Um, so somewhere in this argument for this interferometer, they have to explain where the wave function um, where the photon splits into two, where it becomes two objects that can have different destinies. And they never really explain that. Now, the presumption is, I could assume, that what they're arguing is, is that when the photons actually hit the beam splitter the first time, <coughs> that that's when they're creating this split. That a single photon goes in, goes both directions, like going through both the slits in the two-slit experiment, that somehow a representation of the photon reflects, and some other piece of the photon actually still goes through. So it's one photon, it goes, one piece of it reflects, and one piece of it goes through. So one photon is now one half of a photon, um, whatever it is, it's its wave function, and that these wave functions travel the length of the experiment, reflect off the mirror, maybe we can do the reflections in red, I don't know. Uh, I'll do them in blue. <laughs> I don't, black isn't working, so. So, um, so they come back, and then there are these halves, and then the halves are recombined somewhere, here maybe, maybe not here. Now the halves go, so this half goes through, this half reflects, so these are still half beams, and that somehow these half beams are now two waves, and these two waves create wave interference and decide where to end up over here. So they could end up in a different location depending on how these two waves interfere with each other as they travel this distance to the target. So that's their explanation for the pattern of rings, circles. Now, the circles don't have the same appearance as the, the locations of the bars. In the interferometer experiment, they're not spaced anything like the two-slit experiment. They're basically, the rings get tighter and tighter on the outside, they get closer and closer together. So it's a very different pattern than the double-slit pattern, which is pretty much equally spaced. It isn't the same. Like, if I made this into circles, this pattern wouldn't look like this pattern. They're evenly spaced circles. So let's see that. So there's one reason not to believe this theory. Um, clearly, we don't. We still see that these are whole photons. If I put a if I put a mirror here and deflect this beam into my eye, these are still whole photons. They're not half photons. So 
you know, they're not a wave function of some kind. They're really, even without this half, I can make this half into a real photon. So it seems like real photons are going through here. There isn't some kind of half thing or a broken thing. It's a real photon. <coughs> so that's also a reason to think that doesn't make much sense. And as I've just pointed out, so they need all this theory. It doesn't make any sense. I mean, when I test these, these beams, they don't look like half photons. They don't look like waves. They're not spreading. They're not doing anything like a wave here, like a wave function. They look like real photons in every respect when they're tested. And yet we're to believe that somehow they're going to wave their way to the target. <laughs> you know, and again, it just doesn't make much sense. And, and what's the more reasonable theory? The more reasonable theory is, as has been proven to be true, that if you put garbage, junk, um, bits of space, junk, dust on the surface, you'll create diffraction, spreading, and you'll create high angles inside the glass that will relieve the glass at different locations. And those are, that's a proven theory. So <clears throat> that's the context of these trolls' arguments. They say this is garbage, nonsense, not worth considering. These aren't facts that are at all important. We know all of these truths, and it's all been dealt with somehow, somewhere. They they figured out all this stuff. All the stuff I'm pointing out has nothing to do with it. That the, the, these this dirt on the glass can't possibly be the answer, and internal reflections can't cause possibly be the cause. Somewhere they've proven all that. When there's absolutely no evidence in the historical record that anybody ever did that, that any of this was ever dealt with as an optical experiment, um, and that all these assumptions, all these presumptions, these declarations, the 50-50 mirroring, as I pointed out, 50-50 mirroring can't work. It just can't. It has to be some other number just because part of the light reflected off the first surface. So it has to be some other number than 50-50 because you already reflected some percentage off the top surface. You don't even have 100% of the light hitting the back surface. So it's not even possible. Let's understand by surface, I mean the actual reflection could not, it should, could be off the, the next surface. That is the air layer on the glass. So the glass that the light reflects off the first layer, which is the glass. Then it reflects off the air layer that's the other side of the glass. <laughs> you know, technically that could be what's happening. That's why, like, um, water droplets on the ground, or, or let's just say the, the the classic one where you're you're you know there's a bunch of trees here, you know, and you have a reflection in the water. Right? <laughs> um, <clears throat> the trick to that one is there's no reflection from the second layer of the water. Because the water could be 10 feet deep. So there's no reflection coming from the second layer of the water because the water is on ground. The ground doesn't have any reflective index. So that's the reason. Now, if it was a thin layer of glass that you're doing this on, then the angle would be different that you get to see um, more of this reflection. So that's where it gets complicated. So if you're, if you're viewing off water, what you're really doing is just reflecting off one surface. So here's a lake with water. You're just reflecting the light off the top surface. And that's it. You're not... You're not seeing the light reflected off this bottom surface, you know, refracted and then reflected back out here. Um, and the same is true like water droplets on the street. The water droplet will reflect the light off the top surface, but it won't reflect the light off the grounded surface. So the angle necessary would be different depending on whether you're getting reflections off both surfaces. So how thick the medium is. That's why they call it a thin film um, um, beam splitter. They have such a thing. Because you use a thin film, you're guaranteeing two reflections that are going to be um, very close to the same angle. Because there'll be less refraction inside this thin film. All right. So that's probably enough. So that's, I just wanted to add that as context. So the trolls say this is gibberish. This is incoherent garbage. This has nothing to do with physics. You know, with the the brainiacs have somehow figured all this out and know this isn't the truth and this couldn't possibly be the answer. And there's absolutely no evidence in any of that ever took place. The talking heads have no clue about all this stuff. They just accept what everybody else does. They just assume. 50-50 mirror, yes, it's reflecting half the light. And it's the same. Reflecting and going through the little apertures is exactly the same. Well, we know it's not exactly the same. It's completely different. Light diverging like this is completely different than light going straight. So, what can I say? <laughs> People suck. These arguments suck. These human beings suck as human beings. Um, clearly, I haven't crossed any flat earth lines here at all. I'm not proposing anything 
bizarre or magical. I'm not claiming there to be any um, special magical forces. None of that's taking place. Um, their ridicule is completely unfounded and um, undeserved, inappropriate, unscientific, uh, and, and profoundly ignorant. It's their ignorance that's on display. Anyway, till next time, session.